how we make games and how games make money are inexorably linked together. Let's take a look at how that works, and how it doesn't. First a quick note. I have no inside information on the business of gaming. However, those that do, I would invite to add to the comments and expand this topic as well. I also pass no judgment on the decisions that have been made by the industry in the past or those that are being made right now. The traditional model of producing games involves a print run. Now, the size of the print run, the storage of the, those items, and the sales all factor together. You don't want to print more books than you want to be able to store or be able to sell. However, the larger the print run you make, the more you'll be able to profit per unit. And this is always and still does create issues in terms of finding out the correct print run to make. While many books are sold online today, obviously they used to be sold primarily at gaming stores. This provided a two-way relationship. The gaming store would be able to profit by selling these products, and the companies would be able to have their products seen by more people as long as it was on a store shelf. Another aspect of the traditional model is the production of supplements. Creating a new system or a, even a new setting out of whole cloth is time-consuming and financially a little bit risky. You're not certain if there's a market for this. But you can tap into an existing market by producing more material for it which in itself creates problems. The idea of setting bloat or rules bloat or power creep all come from the idea that, that a company has to continue producing new products that have to sell in order for that company to survive. Obviously that's a choice the company has to make and it's in many cases a less risky one but it can create its own problems, as has been seen historically. Players themselves have a tendency to put publishers into a difficult position with supplements as well. Additional supplements can fragment a player base. However, a game that is no longer producing new material is often considered dead, or at least no longer supported. The industry has been changing over the last few years, and those changes have picked up exponentially in the last few. First off, we're seeing a lot more systems. It used to be the case that a game store could reasonably be expected to carry every existing role-playing system. That's no longer the case. You can't even carry everything from one genre in many cases. PDFs, of course, have made a variety of changes, not the least of which is the creation of systems like drive through RPG or the Bits and Mortar system. And of course we can't forget Kickstarter. Kickstarter has allowed projects to be launched without the creator undertaking a major personal financial risk. Small press has also seen a major rise in the past decade. This not only allows creative people to produce their own games, but also allows those with a more specialized interest in terms of gaming, say somebody who wants to play a social science fiction game, to have a game like Shock available to them, even though that game is likely never to have a large-scale appeal and appear on a store shelf in their local area. Of course, some of these, like Fiasco, do find a wide-scale appeal and often do end up on many store shelves. Small press games have certainly benefited from the PDF sales and Kickstarter, although they're not alone. Uh, larger companies such as White Wolf have also begun to take advantage of the Kickstarter model as well. So with even the larger companies selling games via PDF or online, or even using Kickstarter, what happens to the local gaming stores? Well, they don't tend to benefit from a lot of these changes. The traditional model was likely the most advantageous to them. They are, however, important to the hobby. They are a public face, they are a place that many gamers can gather and play, you can also peruse materials without actually purchasing them, and most importantly, they are important to the hobby for the same reason that the large companies are because they are able to promote gaming to non-gamers and thus expand the number of players we have and for themselves and those creators, the number of customers. To be fair, while the large press companies are crucial to gaming, they do have a design flaw. That is that livelihoods depend upon their success. So they have to make a lot of choices and the safe ones are often the best ones for them to make. Small press doesn't suffer from this issue. Their games can be more experimental However, they are almost guaranteed not to make a profit. This concept of putting a lot of your time and effort into a project with no expectation of a financial reward for it may seem odd to some. However, for me, it simply reminds me of how YouTube works. Unfortunately, a lot of the changes which have occurred in the hobby over the last 10 or 20 years have not necessarily been to the benefit of the companies which do the best job of expanding the hobby's player base and making sure it stays alive. That being, of course, the large companies on the market and the friendly local whole gaming stores. 
there's no simple solution to this. I want to support my local gaming store, but they sell very few games that, I've interested in, that I'm interested in purchasing. At the end of the month, they still have bills to pay, and my good intentions cannot be redeemed for cash value. Relevant links are below, and as always, I hope that your next game is even better than your last.